Okay, this is Wednesday afternoon Bible study via Zoom. We are thankful for the technology of today, even though we may be struggling to uh, learn it all. I've got someone standing on their side <laughs> trying to come in, but we're going to move forward. Today what we're going to be dealing with is signs of the end of the age. How do we know that it's the end of the age? Is that what we are in today? Have we gone past the end of the church age and are we in the tribulation age? How do we know? How do we answer these questions? The question was given to us on the basis of Luke 21 where there are signs given for the end of the age in relation to the Jewish people. Yeshua Jesus speaking to his Talmudim and telling them when his coming back to the nation of Israel would be. That's a different question than those of us who are in what we know to be the church age who are saying, are we at the end of the church age? When we look at the book of Revelation, remember that we had an outline in chapter 1. Yochanan John was told to write the things which already were, the things which are, and the things which will be hereafter. In that basic outline, we saw the past of eternity past, where the presence of God and Yeshua Jesus always was. And we got a beautiful description of both the Father and the Son in chapter 1, the things which were. That does not mean that they're past. We know that they are the very present I am, which is more than present. It is past, it is future, it is present, and it is beyond all three of those because it literally lifts up out of time supersedes time and if you've got a way to explain that to a time oriented time based finite mind then you can come teach because you've got an edge over all of us as we look at the book of revelations outline we move into the time which was in john's day that's the time that that he speaks of in chapters two and three what is called the church age Seven different churches were being written to in the midst of probably hundreds of churches by this point, at least a large number of churches, far more than the seven. But I believe God used those seven to be an example in two ways. One is it was going to show a timeline of, uh, of um, progress in the church age time. The other way was that what each one is being warned about or forewarned or commended or condemned for are lessons for all of us in wherever we are in the church family, whether we were in the first century with the Talmudim that had, had walked and talked with Yeshua Jesus, or whether we're at the end of the time just before the church age ends. And we'll talk about when that is and what that means as we proceed with, with the lesson for today. But keeping that outline to give it to you in its fullness so you understand. When we go past chapters 2 and 3, the church age is not talked about anymore. You don't hear specific instruction being given to the church. And instead, chapter 4 and verse 1 started with Yochanan being called up and being shown a heavenly view and seeing the future from heaven's view because it had not happened yet. He saw things that absolutely blew his mind. If you've ever had a glimpse into the heavenlies, you know that there's nothing on earth that can relate to it. And yet, Yochanan was being shown what would be happening on earth. You had to take one who had never seen a car, never seen an airplane, and show him a nuclear war. Show him advancements in technology that we're just coming on into today that had just been absolutely flabbergasting. I think of Orville and Wilbur Wright and the first time that they got that little plane up in the air for a short period of time. If you had told those two gentlemen that one day people would sit in a plane for hours, would go across the world in that plane, would eat meals on that plane, would watch movies on that plane, it would have blown their mind. But yet that's a reality of today. So we see the progression, we see the moving forward into what, for Yochanan, it's amazing how well he was able to describe it to us. But he's showing us the things which would come after. And that's how it's phrased in chapter 4 and verse 1 is the things hereafter. So here is our outline of past, of present, and of future. It is a simple timeline that I'm giving you today. We've looked at a chart. I can't do the chart on Zoom because I don't think it can catch the full benefit of it. But when we look at that chart and we look at eternity in the past all the way to eternity in the future, we have a timeline that supersedes 
um, the simple definition, but yet I've covered that amount of time. It's as if I've given it to you in a nutshell instead of giving it to you in all of its detail. But because the question for today is dealing with just two major parts of that major timeline that went from eternity past to the times of the patriarchs, to the times of Yeshua, to the times that we're in, to the times that are coming, all we were asked for in this question is Luke 21, the description given, is that telling us that that's where we are now? Is that the end of our age? Or when is that applicable? And when we look at Luke 21, I'm going to also take you, in fact, I'll take you more. I'm going to let you read Luke 21 on your own as you want, but I'll probably take you more into Matthew 24 for this reason. When you look at the two of them together, you will see the language is the same. You will know they're talking about the same events, but Matthew 24 gives more than Luke does. Luke gives it in the nutshell like I just did for our timeline. Matthew stretches it out a bit more, and Matthew takes it in order. So I'm going to use Matthew more for our backbone when we're looking at some of these differences, but also I'm going to specifically draw us to the attention of two periods of time. One being what we call the age of grace or the church age, and the other being the age or the time called the tribulation, the seven year period that we know when the wrath of God is being poured out on the face of the earth. And we know that each one of those ages culminates in the appearance of the Lord, but in a very different way. And I think that's what we need to look at first, is how do we see and how do we differentiate between the coming of the Lord for each group? Because the Lord comes for those in the grace age of grace in one way, and then he comes at the end of the tribulation in a different way. If you try to put these two events together, and some people do and teach it as to be one, I believe that it will open you up to all kinds of confusion and other problems because it's not the same. So let me just show you quickly what I'm referring to to see that difference. Then we'll tell which one goes into which time period and keeping that in mind. Then we will look at what are the signs for the end of the church age, what are the signs for the end of the tribulation age, and or the time of the tribulation, I should put it that way because it's not really a whole age, it's seven years. But uh, comparatively speaking, we have a church age right now that's 2,000 years old approximately. So we see seven years is just a quick little blip on the radar screen, yet an extremely important blip on that, on that screen in God's plan through the ages. So let's go first, since we are in the age called the Age of Grace, or the church age, and when I use the word church, I'm not referring to a denomination. I'm not referring to a specific group. I'm just referring to those who have put their faith in Yeshua Jesus as their Savior, who are looking at Jesus only for salvation, death, burial, resurrection of Yeshua. Jesus was not for himself. It was innocent, perfect, sinless blood applied on the mercy seat by very God himself in the person of Yeshua Jesus who had took on human form that he might rescue or redeem humanity from the wage of sin which is death which is common in all mankind because everyone is born with that sin nature. We see that from the very beginning. You don't teach a baby to be sinful but it isn't long before that little one exerts a self-will an uh, intent that they're the most important and they want their will in their way, etc., etc. Anyone who's raised children knows what I'm talking about. So we're going to, uh, I don't want to sidetrack myself, we're going to be um, looking at a group of people who have put their faith in Yeshua Jesus. And he has made promises to this group of people that he raised up mainly Shaul, Paul, Paul was Shaul, he was Saul first, he was a persecutor of the believers in Messiah, in Yeshua Jesus, and then he came to faith in Yeshua Jesus, and he became one of our greatest, if not our greatest, uh, teachers uh, for us in this time. We're going to look at his words, his letter that he wrote to one of his churches that he um, had given birth to, and so it was precious to him. And he's sharing something very dear with them that is dear to us to this day. What I'm referring to is uh, First Thessalonians. This was a group, and if you want to turn to First Thessalonians, I'm going to try one more time on my tablet and see, or on the, my laptop and see if I can handle it with class today. 
and uh, I think I'm already getting my answer. Okay. Pardon me when you hear pages turn. Uh, hopefully it won't be deafening to your ear. I will try to be quiet with my Bible, but I'm just not good with a laptop, and I don't want to go slow, so I apologize. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is where I'm headed, in case if you want to get there. Thessalonians is the name of the people that lived in Thessaloniki. This was a, a little community. Shaul Paul had been there. He brought together a group. He shared with them his faith in Messiah, Yeshua Jesus as Savior, what I've just uh, been declaring. They came together in faith believing the same thing, and they formed what is called a church. Church just simply means a called out assembly. What are they called out of? They're called out of the world. And they are to be living a life that is sanctified. And sanctified means you're set apart, pulled out of that world, set apart from that world, and you're set apart unto God. And that is how your relationship should be, is in relationship to your God that you are trying to live a life holy and pure and acceptable unto Him. There is a false teaching that goes out today that if you just claim the name of Jesus, then you can go live your life and you've got your uh, fire insurance and you get to heaven one day. Well, anyone who wants to enter into the presence of God has to come through that shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, not to just be fire insurance that keeps you from going to a place of torment, but you're coming into, into a relationship with this one who is going to affect changes in your life, who is going to call you to live a holy and a right life according to the, the uh, word of God, according to the commandments and the law that was given. We don't throw out the law, we throw out the condemnation of the law. We're no longer condemned by it, but we do have to have something that tells us the standard God wants us to live by. Because if it's left up to man, man cannot, even two can't agree on where that standard would be. If you want to base your salvation on your good works, who gets to say how many works are good enough? You really want to gamble with the fact that you could show up one day in the presence of God and he could look through a list and say, well, you only did 499 good acts, but your neighbor did 501, so your neighbor gets in and you don't because 500 was the cutting off point. How unfair would that be and, and what a horrible way to live where you're living with an uncertainty of something that the Lord wanted to give you as a, as a surety, as a no-so. And so he gave us the standard we have to live to. And that standard, if you do not live to that, you are not allowed in the presence of heaven, period. That's it. Now, you show me any person, any time, through all the ages, who has lived up to that holy standard. And I will show you the only one called Yeshua Jesus. No one else has been able to do that. He was able to because he was fully God. And in the power of God, he was able to live a perfect and a sinless life. Thankfully, he made the way. And he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And so in his making the way, we now get to go into the presence of God through his sacrifice for us. If we could get there on our own good works, then why did Yeshua Jesus need to die? That would be a horrible thing that he went through if there were any other way that we could obtain our salvation apart from the suffering that he had to take on for us. And especially to take on becoming the sin offering, a holy God that was willing to. And it even separated him momentarily from Jehovah when he had to turn his back on his son, the darkness on the face of the earth, the cry out from the, the one on the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He took that moment when he became that sin offering for us, knowing in the power of the resurrection of our God that he was going to be raised from the dead, conquer the, the wages of sin that he could obtain for all of us for all time, eternal life in the presence of our God. Hallelujah that he did it for us and he did it all. And to say that we can do it apart from him is nothing but a slap in the face of God. And again, where could God put a standard that we all would agree to that would be fair for everybody? The only way is when God says, this is my role, this is my law, this is my way. These people in Thessalonica had come to believe this. They had put their faith in the Lord. But now something had happened since they had Shaul Paul with them. And you've got to remember, they didn't have a Bible to pick up, open it up, study it all, get all the answers like we're able to today. 
So they had come to a time that I think many of us have come to in our life where a loved one has passed away. Nice way to say that they've died. And they're grieving. They're, they're afraid that because this one has died before the return of the Lord that they were looking for, that this one is not going to be with them. And so Shaul Paul is coming to them at a time when they need to hear the truth and that truth is going to comfort them. It's going to bring them a peace that will carry them through the death of a loved one. That will carry them through one of the hardest things that we as human beings experience in this life. And we start out in verse 13 with Shaul Paul saying, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Now, scripture is important. Every word is important. And we need to read it right. <laughs> because right here you could get in trouble. And uh, I heard it brought out by a, a beloved um, giant in the faith who was home with the Lord in heaven much, many years beyond me uh, in age. He put it this way. He said, depending on where you pause and where you put your inflection, you could read him saying, I would not have you, ignorant brethren. <laughs> and yet that wasn't what Shaul Paul's intent was. He was not calling them ignorant. He was not saying, I don't want you. On the contrary, he is bringing them a word of comfort. And he is saying, but I would not have you ignorant. I don't want you, brethren, not to know. What does he not want them ignorant about? concerning them who are asleep. Now don't take that word and think that there is something called soul sleep. This was their polite way of saying someone had died. It is not telling you that they go to sleep and that there's a time period because notice what is happening in this gives no room for a time period like that. And we talked about it last week also, so if you did not uh, see the video or, or hear the video last week, we went much into to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Nothing in between. Your body goes into the grave. Your soul goes into its eternal position, whether it be in the heavenlies with the Lord or in a holding tank place of already suffering that will only be worse when you're cast into the hellfires later in time. But Paul's referring to those who were in the Lord. And he's saying, I don't want you to, to be ignorant. I don't want you to know about those who are dead. That you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. We, yes, we grieve. And he's not saying don't grieve, but he's saying don't grieve as if you don't have any hope. Well, what hope do we have? What is he telling them? Verse 14, if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, even so them also who sleep in Yeshua, see they're in Yeshua, will God bring with him. Okay, there's a time when they're with Yeshua and God's going to bring them. What's he talking about? For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, not by Paul's word, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them who are asleep. Okay, there's a day coming. We call it the coming of the Lord. In that day, those of us who are awake, those of us who are still living, we're not going to go first. There's a group that precedes us, and here's who precedes us. The Lord himself will descend from heaven. We know that's where he is now, at the right hand of the Father. He will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump or the shofar of God. And the dead in Yeshua, the dead in Messiah, the dead in Christ, shall rise first. In some way, that body that has laid in the grave, that has gone back to dust if it's been long enough, is going to be brought back into a form, reunited with its soul, its spirit, and changed into a new, incorruptible form, an incorruptible body. The same way Yeshua, Jesus, rose from the dead, and he had form still. But he had a form that was never going to bleed. The blood was gone. The life was in the flesh and the bone now. It was flesh that would never decay. It would never suffer. It would never hurt in any way. And he is saying those who are asleep, they, they get to come up first. They're reunited with, with their soul that has been waiting with something intermittent for them in heaven because I do not believe that they're ghosts hanging around. They've been in the presence of the Lord, seen and recognized by others who are in heaven. 
And then as we go on with the verse, they've raised first, then we who are alive. And Paul thought it would be even in his day, so he's talking to everyone. And that, by the way, silences the voices that say that this is a doctrine that was not taught until about the 15th century or even later. No, Paul taught it in the very first century. He thought it would be in his day, we who are alive and remain, will be caught up together with them, with those that, that had died before us, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And that clouds probably is referring to the cloud of witnesses. It's probably referring to the many people that we're caught up together with. It doesn't mean that it's, it's our little white fluffy clouds here. We meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What greater comfort could there be than to stand at the graveside with someone, put your arm around them and remind them, your dead one is alive in heaven right now. You will be reunited with that one in a coming day when the Lord comes back for us, catches us all up, we'll all get to be together and hallelujah, death will never enter there. There is no repeat. There is no coming around again. There is no history repeating itself. That is the final. Death is out of the picture forever. This is our blessed hope. It is called the blessed hope in, in uh, Titus 2.13. And we're told it, it's the blessed hope. We look forward to this. 1 Corinthians 15, start with verse 51 talks also and it, that's where it tells us that we put on that incorruptible that we're changed in the twinkling of an eye as we go up and by the way even though the dead in Christ beat us up there we all come so fast all that happens happens faster than your eye blink faster than your snap of your fingers faster than what's called the twinkle of the eye in the twinkling of the eye we are all brought together and we will live forever with the Lord in His presence. And that, you can send out a hallelujah. If we were in class, I'd hear the hallelujahs. That you can do the deaf way where you're clapping, and I see you clapping, and I see you're one with me. Thumbs up. This is what we praise our Lord for. This is our blessed hope, and this is what we know will close out the, the age that we call the church age. Because He's come and He's gotten all those who believe in Him who have through the time period since he resurrected from the dead and he started the church age in Acts chapter 2 all the way through to whatever year it is when he comes back for those who remain alive. Now we know what follows that time on this earth then. Remember chapter 4 and verse 1 of Revelation was a picture of like the rapture. John being caught up. So now the, the believers are in heaven and there's an earthly scene that we start seeing after that. Four Chapters 4 and 5 in Revelation still give us a heavenly scene. But as soon as it starts talking about the earth again, chapter 6 tells us the events of the tribulation all the way through chapter 19. It does not mention the church. It mentions those who are earth dwellers. It does not mention those who are the citizens of heaven, which is who we are when we have a relationship with Yeshua Jesus. And that culminates in the second coming of the Messiah, the second coming of Yeshua Jesus. That's what we need to look at. Keep this in mind. Keep in mind that I've shown you in this picture that's drawn out for us that we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We do not call this the second coming of the Lord. In his first coming, did he come into the air and stop there? I should see heads shaking No. He came all the way down to earth. He was born through the virgin birth. He was, he was raised as a toddler. He was a young person. We know when he was 12, he was in the temple confounding the wise men. We know that about the age of 30, he came into his ministry that we read about in the four Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that give us the story of his earthly life. That was his first coming. It was foreshadowed in the original covenant through many of our prophets, Micha, Isaiah, Yeshua, Micah, um, Ezekiel, Daniel, to, to say them quickly for you, Isaiah, Jeremiah. I, I, really, um, it's the story of the Mace Road. I love that story. After he had resurrected, they did not know who he was, but when he talked to these men who were crying in their beards because 
Jesus had been crucified on the cross and they didn't know of his resurrection yet, he started telling them about himself. And he said he took them to Moshe's words. That's the Torah, the first five books. He took them from there into the prophets, into the Psalms, because all of the scriptures spoke of him. That's the beauty of it. It was all showing and pointing toward. Now here it was happening. Now we're on the other side where we're looking back. And by the way, when he broke matzah with them, gave a Hebrew blessing and broke matzah, they suddenly realized who they were in the presence of as he blessed them. And the eyes were open to know who he was, and they were so excited, they ran seven miles back to Jerusalem to tell the Talmudim they had seen the risen Messiah and Savior. And they ran back at night. They were so excited they couldn't wait for the day. I get that. Anyway, so on track, when we see Yochanan John caught up, is a picture being caught up, and this is what we give, and yes, the word is not in Scripture. We give it a word today called the rapture. Now, again, the, the teaching of the rapture was all the way back from Paul. I just gave it to you in Paul's own words. The word is a Latin word, rapizzo. It means the catching up, the catching away. In the scripture, we look at a different word that was given then, but the connotation for it today is different, so we don't use that word because just like King James English has changed through the years and things don't mean the same, that word doesn't mean the same either. I'm referring to apostasia, which sounds like apostasy, but really with the Greek, uh, which Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in because they were in a Greek community, is called the falling away, or the better way to put it is the departure. The departure is the most accurate way of saying it, that there would be a great departure. Now, some look at that and say it as a negative, but I see it as a positive, that they were caught up, departed from this earth into the presence of the Lord. Now, when we look at Revelation 19, we're going to look at what is called the second coming. Remember the first coming, Yeshua's feet touched the earth. He walked on this earth. He lived in Israel. He walked in Galilee. He walked in Jerusalem. He walked all over. And those of us who had the blessing of being there go to places where he was. And we don't see, even though they try to show you, an actual footprint. But we know he put his feet there. So when we're talking about his coming a second time, and keep in mind he's telling his Talmudim, his Jewish men, who know nothing but the, the original scriptures, the, the prophets and the Torah and the, the Psalms, they do not know about our age, our time. They're not told about it, so they're not. that's not in their mind. So when they're asking Yeshua Jesus, what's the end of the age? What's the sign of your coming again? Because he's telling them he's going to go away. Okay, well, if you're going to leave, then when are you coming back? They wanted to know. And so he refers his answer, Yeshua, Jesus answers them on the basis of where they're coming from, what they know. So he's talking to Jewish followers who know the Jewish promises to the nation of Israel. And they are asking, when is the coming millennial age? When is the coming time when you, Messiah, will sit on Melch David, on King David's throne? When will you fulfill the promises that you've made to the nation of Israel? Because obviously if you're leaving, they're not being fulfilled today. Israel's not raising up as a head nation. Rome's yoke is not being broken off. The things that they expected for him to do as king, he was not doing because he came as suffering servant the first time. He came to deal with the sin question. He came to fulfill the scriptures that said he would come low, riding on a donkey, not coming crowned king and riding on a majestic horse. He had to take care of all of that first, but his second coming will fulfill all of those scriptures that are yet to be fulfilled. He will come back and sit on the throne. He will bring Israel up as the head nation. The rest of the world will come up to Israel, to the temple, to be blessed by the one sitting on the throne of David. All of that will be fulfilled and we see that coming from Revelation, the end of 19. We see it coming in chapter 20 especially where we're given the description of the millennial age and then we go into eternity future after that with 21 and 22. But let me take us to chapter 19 and I think I want to take you real quickly first to, um, I'm going to start with verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice. Give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. Now, the Lamb, we know, is the Lamb of God. That's Yeshua, Jesus. And it's, we are told that this 
group called the church is the bride of Christ. And our next phrase tells us that the bride of the wife has made herself ready. She's already become the wife. And she's made herself ready. She's clothed in the robe of righteousness. And that's what we get in verse 8. To her it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now, we know that we are clothed in his robe of righteousness, Yeshua Jesus', that's what makes us white. It washes away our sin. We're clothed in his robe of righteousness. So this picture of his bride shows that we have put on that robe of righteousness. We have received that reward that is ours. Now, keeping that in mind, you come a little further down in chapter 19. Go to verse 11. What happened in 7 and 8 has already taken place before 11 because we're going to see the description in, in uh, verse 14 that shows 7 and 8 prior to it. So verse 11 is telling us now about that second coming that I've been talking to you about that's going to be the end time for the tribulation period. And we read, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Who is called faithful and true? We know that's Jesus. Remember, I'm the truth. I'm the way. I'm the truth. He's the one called faithful. He's the one who's called true. And in righteousness, he does judge and make war. And we're told that God put the judging of the world into the hands of Yeshua because he lived that human life. He has the right to judge his fellow man. And he will make war uh, with the Antichrist at the end of the tribulation actually he comes at that point of battle of Armageddon and he will stop that war by the sword that proceeds of his mouth that's the very word of God the Bible is the sword of God it tells us in verse 12 his coming in that war frame his eyes were like a flame of fire on his head were many crowns he's wearing his crown now he is not coming lowly suffering servant riding on a donkey. He's coming on that horse which showed majesticness. He's crowned with many crowns. He has a name written that no one knew but himself and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Yochanan John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And then we're told in verse 14 that word tabernacled among men. So we know that word is Yeshua Jesus because how did God tabernacle among men that Yochanan John's recording? In the human flesh of Yeshua Jesus. So this is the one we're talking about. Vesture dipped in blood shows war. He has come. There is bloodshed happening because he is putting a stop to a horrible war. And look who comes with him. Verse 14, And the armies that were in heaven followed him upon white horses. And what did they look like? They were clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, Yochanan's writing this whole thing to us, or to, to his churches that he's writing to. Um, but my point is, he's writing a letter. He's not writing something that he's chopping up and he's giving a piece here and he's giving a piece there. He's writing a continuous letter. We've put in the chapters and verses so that we can follow or get around easily. So I can tell you, go to chapter 19 and verse 7 and we can all get there quickly. Where a letter with no markings, you, if you don't have page number something to help you, you'd have a hard time getting there. My point being, there's no time in between his writing, verse 7 and 8, talking about the bride, the wife, is wearing fine linen, clean and white, in verse 14, saying that those who come back with him are wearing fine linen, clean and white. Obviously, he's got one thought in his mind. And he is telling us about who we call the church, who is now put on the robe of righteousness when they were raptured, coming back with him. And we are going to come back to rule and reign with him because um, first or second Corinthians 3, I think it's second, might be first, tells us about our ruling and reigning. That, that even what we go through in this life is, as my dad would put it, present training for future reigning. So when you're in your trials and your struggles, remember that you're being trained for a position that God wants you to rule and reign to help him in the millennial time when Yeshua is sitting on the throne. And that's what this is leading up to. So we come back with him. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. We know that's what we see in the next chapter in the millennium. He treads the winepress of the fierceness, the wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his vesture, on his thigh, a name written, 
King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is how he comes back. And he comes back to the Mount of Olives. He puts his feet on the Mount of Olives. It cleaves in two. It makes a huge valley. There's a lot of change that takes place. But his feet come all the way down, touching the, the Mount of Olives. Here we're told that he comes back uh, to Armageddon. We've read these scriptures before. Um, I'll get you references later. I don't have them at the tip of my hand. Um, but there are many of them. Um, I'm sorry, I should have had them. I'm sure they'll come up somewhere in my notes today. Uh, they will. So as we go on, I've got them, I can see. So we'll hit on those points then. But my point is, do you see the difference between the second coming and the rapture? One is in the air, it catches up those who believe in him. We put on our immortality, we're given his robe of righteousness. Those are the people we see coming back with him to rule and reign, to stop the war that has been on earth, coming against Israel. It says that no flesh should be left alive if he didn't come back when he did. We know that's possible today with nuclear technology. And we see he comes all the way back to the earth and puts his feet down on the Mount of Olives and he comes as King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And as we go on into the next chapter, um, in fact, actually, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to skip it. Read the, the chapter 19 in order. <coughs> Excuse me. But chapter 20 will tell you about his setting up his kingdom and ruling and reigning on earth. So you know that it is an actual earthly landing, shall I put it that way? Not that he comes in a spaceship. He does not. But he comes all the way down to the earth. So now we see two very separate times that we're talking about. One ends our church age, our age of grace, and one ends the tribulation time. So when we read the description given in Luke 21 or in Matthew 24, which is he referring to? Well, again, I remind you, Luke and Matthew knew nothing about this age that we call the church age, this, uh, this age of grace. They're not made aware of that. They're made aware only of what is in relation to Israel. Israel is not who is raptured. It is the believers who are raptured. Does that mean Jewish people aren't raptured? No. It means that the nation of Israel is not raptured up. The nation of Israel is a physical and it's here on this earth. But Jewish people, just like Gentile people who put their faith in Yeshua Jesus for salvation, are the ones who are raptured up. So we see a, a total separation to the Talmudim. He was telling them when they were asking, Okay, you've told us the temple is going to be destroyed. We know that happened in 70 AD. You told us that you're going away. When are you coming back? When is our temple going to be restored? When are we going to see you on the throne? When are you going to be king of kings? When are you going to break Rome's rule? When are you going to, to lift Israel up to the head position promised her through all the prophets? Through all of what was written before that they were aware of? And that's how he answered the question. He answered Jewish minds with what's in relation to Israel. So he did not tell them about this time. They would not have understood it. They had enough that was confusing them at this point in time. And he told them what they were needing to know to answer their question legitimately. So when we look at the um, signs given in Matthew and given in Luke, I think you already know which period it belongs to. But we're going to look at those signs and we're going to look at the signs for the end of the church age. And just like we looked at the two comings of the Lord, we're going to look at those two and see which is which. And then we'll take our question into it, where are we today? Are we looking at tribulation signs? Are we looking at tribulation events? Or are we looking at the age of grace, the church age, signs and events? Okay? So, swallow of water, excuse me. And let's look, um, let me, since I've ended here in Revelation with the second coming, let's look at some of those references in scripture to back up what I've been saying. When we call it the tribulation, we get that um, out of scripture. I think you're very familiar with it being called the time of great tribulation. Um, well, the great tribulation is the last three and a half years, but I think that you're familiar with it called um, the tribulation. I'm looking for it quickly. I'll find it as we go along. Let me give you other names first because we are familiar with that one. When we talk about the day of the Lord, we are talking about a period of time that the uh, original covenant, the Old Testament prophets uh, looked at, were told about, they were told 
that this is when God is going to visit the earth in judgment, that he is going to judge the wickedness of the earth, and he's going to save his people, the remnant of Israel, he's going to save them out of it. Okay, let's go to Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 30 and verse 3. And we read, for the day is near, even the day of the Lord is near. Here's one place where we get that title. The day of the Lord is near, a cloudy day. It shall be a, the time of the nations. This is something that's coming on the Gentile nations is what he's saying. doesn't mean Israel's exempt, but it's coming on the world. That's one of the things that we need to always remember. The tribulation affects the entire world. Until we had COVID-19, I don't think we fully grasped and understood what that meant. And I'm going to pause right now for a moment and, and give you that this opportunity to think about it. In a moment of time, our world changed. In a moment of time, we suddenly were infected by something that came from another nation, that came across the seas, that came into our very backyards, and that has taken out lives of people in many different nations, many different places. It is a worldwide endemic that they're calling a pandemic. This is something that's affecting everybody. It's affecting people in Israel, people in China, people in the Philippines, people in the United States. In the United States, it's affecting people in New York. It's affecting people in California. What do all these people have in common? Or did they all go to the same place? No. They all, what they have in common is they all live on this earth, and it's affecting the entire earth. That gives us a foreshadowing of what happens during the tribulation time that separates the tribulation from all other horrible trials and tribulations that have come on the earth but were not the tribulation the scripture refers to. For instance, the Holocaust, the horrors of the Holocaust, I will never minimize. The Holocaust affected lives in a certain area. It did not come on people all over the world the way this virus has come on people all over. So that somebody in San Bernardino loses their life because of it. What we see in the tribulation times is the bowls of wrath that are poured out, the plagues that affect the earth affect the whole earth. When it says it takes out a third of the trees and the rivers and the seas, that's a third worldwide. That's not just in one little location. It's not just in Europe. It's not just in Asia. It's on all the continents. It's worldwide. And we begin to see how one thing can affect the world. That one little thing that couldn't even be seen, a virus that spread in the air and we couldn't see it. Now bring into that all that we read in Revelation 6 to 19 and the one after another after another after another of horrors of, of signs in the sky like hail that takes people's lives because it's so big to the waters turning to blood to all kinds of descriptive events that let us know the horror of the tribulation and again what I stress is the tribulation is worldwide so because we're seeing one thing affect our world today, there are many people that are jumping, that are doing a panic and saying, oh no, this is worldwide, we must be in the tribulation. No, this is a foreshadowing to give you a sample and a taste of what is happening. The same way I think it was Dr. McGee, who is a familiar Bible teacher, well respected by many people, used the analogy of driving into a mountain. When you drive into the mountain, before you get into the mountain, the shadow of that mountain falls on you. The closer you get to the mountain, the more you're into that shadow. You're beginning to see what that mountain is like. You're beginning to see the effects. You're beginning to feel the mountain. You'll begin to feel the cooler air because of the, the trees from the mountain, especially if you've come from a desert area. Well, that's what's happening to us right now. The tribulation is that mountain. And the closer we're getting to that mountain, the more we're experiencing and understanding and getting a feel for what it is like in the tribulation. But it doesn't mean we're there yet. And I'll show you how we know where we are before we get to the end of this study. By looks on the clock, i got to get moving. Um, so I, I may need to shorten how many scriptures I give to you. But it, I can, upon request, 
send you a printout of scriptures that will give you many more scriptures because if I talk slow enough for everyone to write them down, we will be here till midnight. <laughs> um, but there are many scriptures to back up what we're saying. Uh, remember, we let scripture interpret scripture. I need to ask how many of you, pardon my interruption, but I'm hearing a gardener out in our uh, um, neighborhood. Is it bothering? Is it coming across? No. Okay, then unless it gets louder, I'm not going to go close the door because that gives us some fresh air. <laughs> okay, let's look at another place because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. So let me take you quickly to Joel. Yoel in our Hebrew. Joel, it's just a little book. Oba, Obatiah, Jonah, Mike, I'm too far. Okay, Joel, Amos. If you see a, um, what am I going to tell you? What book? Just go a little past Daniel. Everybody I think can find Daniel, you'll find Yoel, Joel. Chapter 1 and verse 15, and we read there, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Okay, there's our term again, day of the Lord. And are we told in this scripture it's a happy day? Did you hear the description? Alas! The day of the Lord is at hand as a destruction from the Almighty shall come. This is a day that's going to bring destruction. This is judgment. This is not, oh, happy day. Here comes the day of the Lord. No, on the contrary. This is a time when the, the wickedness of this earth is being judged by our holy God. And he will save his people out of it. Because there will be many who will either be martyred for their faith and come into the presence of our Lord during the the tribulation or there will be those who will literally make it to the end of the tribulation okay so I can tell you that I can give you many more scriptures in Joel I can give them to you in Amos, Amos, Ovadia, Obadiah and Zechariah, Zechariah there are scriptures that all sound just like what I'm saying many many descriptions of it okay I want to take you back to Thessalonians because we were in there studying it and we know that Paul was talking to them about uh, the church age but he also tells them about the coming of the tribulation age and he helps us know the timing and know the difference when we look at 1 Thessalonians again the first letter he wrote to the Thessalonican people we are going this time to chapter 5 last time I finished through chapter 4 so remember we're reading a letter we're picking up Paul didn't stop and say, take a pause, go away, come back. He wrote, read continually, he wrote continually. So chapter 5, I can give you the first verse just to show you that he's going to this, this continuing thought now. He's just told them to, be, to comfort each other with the words of the blessed hope of the rapture. Now in chapter 5 and verse 1 he says, But the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. We know that God has times and seasons. We know that it's very Jewish thinking to know that there are times and seasons. They were given to us all the way back in Bereshit in, in Genesis. But he's going on he's saying, I don't have to set that down for you and tell you. For you yourselves know perfectly, and this is verse, uh, verse 2, that the day of the Lord comes as a thief of the night. Well, now we've just looked at the term day of the Lord, right? So we know what he's talking about. He's not talking about the rapture now, is he? He's talking about a day of judgment coming. He's talking about, alas, a horrible destructive day that is coming. And he's saying it's going to come like a thief in the night. Keep that description in mind for a moment. And if I don't forget, I'm going to point out something very important for you. So if I don't bring it out, someone red flag me in a few minutes, okay? Thief in the night, how he's going to come. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as a travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Okay, we rejoice today that we've got two coming, um, that they're pregnant now, and they're going to have babies, one in August and one in December. How are they going to know when their time arrives? Suddenly, they're going to get a birth pain. Suddenly, they're going to get another birth pain. And as those birth pains increase and get stronger and get closer and faster together, the baby comes. Well, that's what he's referring it to. The day of the Lord is going to come suddenly like a birth pain. And we know even right now, we're beginning to feel those birth pains of what's coming. What's coming is that tribulation time. That baby that's about to be birthed is not a happy day 
like for us what we talk about that's the day of the tribulation coming this destruction this that that's the horrors of it but now notice and I am going to remember to bring out my thought thank you Lord verse 4 tells us something very critically important don't miss every word but you brethren okay who's he talking to Paul's writing it you my brethren that means that he's writing it to people who believe in the Lord the same way he does to have faith in the Lord he's calling them brethren they're brothers and sisters in the Lord we use that expression today that means a fellow believer who's on the same page with us you brethren are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief remember that day is going to come as a thief in the night it's not coming to you you're not in darkness it's not going to overtake you like a thief verse 5 you are all sons of light and sons of the day we are not of the night nor of darkness okay that makes it very clear the tribulation is darkness it is night it comes as a thief it comes to bring destruction it comes because of judgment but you you're of the day you're of the light who's the light I am the light of the world you are part of the light of the world Yeshua Jesus own words you are part of the day and you will escape this coming time it's not going to come on you as a thief in the night you know the thief breaks in unexpectedly the thief you didn't know the thief was coming he's saying that's not going to happen to you you can see it coming but you're not going to be part of it because you're of the day then he goes on and tells them don't be asleep don't slumber don't don't miss because you're you're drunk and you haven't paid attention and you haven't gotten your salvation in the Lord you need to be in the Lord so that you do not miss this day but let us again verse 8 let us who are of the day be sober that means to be to be thoughtful to be contemplative toward it to be um, thinking on these things put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope is salvation for God's not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation deliverance by our Lord Jesus Christ he's just summed it all up that if we are if our minds are in the Lord if we are one in him we put on the breastplate of faith that means by faith we have accepted Jesus as our Savior as our salvation and we have that as the helmet for our heads as for our minds he is our and when it says hope is salvation it's the same way that we have the blessed hope of his coming in scripture that hope is a no so hope that's not a, I hope it won't rain today that's I know I have put my hope in this sure thing that is going to happen because God has not appointed us to wrath in other places we're going to see the tribulation times is called the wrath of God the judgment of God poured out we're not appointed to that but we are appointed to salvation to the deliverance that we get how in the Lord Jesus how does he deliver us it was just given to us in chapter 4 he's just told us how he'll catch us up in the air before the wrath is poured out and then it goes on you can keep reading it to the end for the words of encouragement but I want to take you to his second letter right away also because keep in mind he's writing letters to a group of people now if you write a letter to a friend and you've told them certain things in the first letter and you send a second letter pretty close in succession are you going to write the same things again no are you going to tell new things are you going to build on what you already wrote quite likely quite likely you're going to continue your thoughts with them you know they have questions you're giving them answers the same way that I was given a question I gave part of an answer last week and this week I'm coming back with a fuller answer that's what we see happening so in the second letter to the Thessaloniki people the same group of people he, Paul doesn't need to lay down that foundation again he doesn't need to lay down here's what's going to happen here's the order it's going to happen and here's uh, what the, the the coming of the Lord for you looks like he's going to be able to continue on his thought but something happened between that first letter and that second letter that provoked Paul to write the second letter 
And we get a hint of that when we get past his opening remarks in chapter 1. We get a hint of that in chapter 2. Chapter 2, he says, um, and when he says we, it's because Silvanus is, is, and Timothy are with Paul when he's writing the letter, and he's greeting them from all of them. So he's, he's speaking for all of them, but it's Paul who's, who's speaking the words. And he's speaking by the, um, oh, what's the word, the Lord giving him um, the inerrant thought. I can't think of the word, but you all know what word I want. The, the inspiration. He's speaking by the inspiration of God. He's not giving you what he thinks. Anytime Paul gives you his own personal opinion, he very clearly says, this is my thought. This is my opinion. This is my conclusion. When he's not doing that, he's giving us from God. So he's speaking the words of God and he's beseeching them. That means he, he's, he's pleading with them. This is serious. And again, who's he talking to? brethren. So to you fellow believers, listen. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, didn't we talk about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? Wasn't that chapter 4 in the first letter? That was the very words that he's already told them about and followed through in chapter 5 where the letter ended. So he's picking up right there again and he's talking about that the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto Him. Is that not a description of chapter 4? The coming of the Lord and us being gathered together with Him, caught up in the air to be with Him. So we know what He's talking about. He's telling about that time again. He's picking it up there. Why is He doing that? I'm going to close the window because that's getting loud for me. Excuse me. Go off just a moment. Okay, I can't get it all the way closed, but I hope that helps. Um, I, I don't want to lose our train of thought here. He's talking about the very same time, and his next verse tells us why he picked up that thought and why he's carrying on from there. He says, so that you not soon shaken, oh, I mean, you be not soon shaken in mind. Be not troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, that the day of the Lord is present. What does that verse mean? That means that somebody, and the hint I think here is by letter. Somebody wrote a letter to the, the Thessalonian people, and they signed Paul's name to it. They forged his signature, and they told them, Hey, you people, you blown it. You missed that coming of the Lord. And you're now in the day of the Lord. I think they must have had a trial, a tribulation. Maybe they had a pandemic. Maybe they had something affecting the world. And somebody jumped on it and said, Oh, hey, this is the day of the Lord. And you're in it. This coming of the Lord that you think you're, you're waiting for, you've missed it. Well, what did that do to these new young believers? <laughs> it scared the daylights out of them. Remember the children of the day? <laughs> well, the day couldn't be taken out of them. It shook them. It shook them to the core. Their boat is rocking. And Shaol Paul is like a father to them. And so he pours his heart out to them. Listen. Hold on. Wait. Pull the horse's reins back. Stop. Don't be shaken so soon that the day of the Lord is present. That hasn't happened. Let me tell you how I know it hasn't happened. And he goes on and he tells them, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. The day of the Lord shall not come, except there come. And now he's going to give certain signs first. Okay? So these signs that we're getting here are signs of the coming of the day of the Lord. Not the coming of the what we call rapture, the catching up of, uh, of us to be with the Lord. These are the signs for the tribulation time. What are they? The first is the falling away first. Now the Greek says it very clearly. The departure is the Greek words here. I'm going to read the rest of the verse, then we're going to come back to this. That has to happen, the falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, and we'll find out who he is. Okay, so we're looking for two major things that are happening here. There's a falling away, there's a departure, 
and there's a man of sin being revealed. Now, the word for the falling away or the departure in the Greek, again, as I hinted earlier, is called apostasia. People take that word, and it sounds like our English word apostasy today, and they jump on it, and they say, wow, there's going to be an apostasy first. Okay, now, that can be true at one level, but I don't think it's the complete meaning of the word, and I'll show you why as we go on. It's specific in the Greek. It, Paul is talking about a specific departure, a specific falling away. Now, if I follow that and I think to myself, okay, Paul wrote a first letter. In that first letter, did he talk about a departure? Did he talk about a catching away, which is also how that word is, um, is translated? Did he talk about that in the first chapter? Well, yes, Paul, you did. You talked about it in chapter 4. You talked about us being caught up to be with the Lord in the air. The departure. The departure from the earth. I believe that's the fuller meaning of what he's saying here. Now, is it true that apostasy will come first? Yes. That there would be those who will be falling away from the faith? That they seem as if they're believing, but then they move out of the camp of believers into the unbelievers? Because all who are with us are not with us. And we know that. We see that happen today. That there are those who profess it on the outside but they've never possessed it. It's never been part of them on the inside. Anyone who truly is in the Lord will not leave. In fact, they can't leave. They can't come out of the Lord's hand. He keeps them safe. And remember, God's hand's around the Lord's hand. And he says that none that the Father gave him would be lost. So, yes, it is true that there's an apostasy. And it gets greater as we go on. It's so great as we read when we come down, and we'll read it in just a moment, when we get into further verses in chapter 2 of, of Thessalonians here, we're going to read that there's such a, a, deceive, a deceitfulness, such a deluge, such a lie, that it, if it were possible, even the believers at that time would be leave that lie. That's how bad it's going to get. If you think it's hard to tell the right from the wrong and the truth from the fiction right now, it's nothing like what it will be then. So yes, there is also an apostasy, but I think you'd be very hard pressed to pick a specific apostasy. We see this as one that's been growing and continually grows. Well, how would we use that as a marker then? Where would we say that it's suddenly called the apostasy that we could mark and say, okay, this has to come before that. A little harder to see, a little harder to understand. Again, another reason why I believe is referring to a departure that can be seen. We do depart this earth, and then what follows right after that? Our next sign that we're given. The man of sin be revealed. Well, who's the man of sin? Okay, he's also called the son of perdition. Now, we know Judas was given that title, son of perdition, when Satan entered into him, and he betrayed our Lord. Are we going back to that time? No, because that had already happened, and Paul's talking about something that's the future. So I believe what happened with Judas and the title he was given, again, was a foreshadowing to show us what was coming in the future. That there's going to be a man so evil that he's called the man of sin. And furthermore, he's even called the son of perdition, which means Satan indwells him. Well, we know that from our study in Revelation to be a description of the Antichrist. So... This departure happens, and then the man of sin is revealed. On the basis of this verse, if I'm understanding it accurately, I fully believe, and there are others who agree with me, we will not see the Antichrist on the scene known as this one, this man of sin, son of perdition. What I mean by that is I believe he could be alive and well in this world today. I believe he very much could be working behind the scenes that we may even know him by his name, but we don't know him by this name. We don't know him by this character. We're going to be gone before he's revealed in such a way that people who are reading this will be able to know he's an Antichrist. How are they going to know? Let's look at the description. What does he do? 
This one called the son of perdition opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Okay, what do we have? We have one who is going to put himself in the temple and he's going to say, worship me, I am God. Now we know that's what the Antichrist does because remember our study in Revelation tells us about that time and tells us that any who are believers at that time in Jerusalem need to flee. They need to get out. They need to go before they can't get out because now comes the full wrath of God down on this earth because of this one who's setting himself up to receive worship that belongs to God and to God alone. And he, he goes on and he says, Remember you not when I was with you? I told you about these things. So again, he's writing this to reassure them. Don't panic. The man of sin hasn't been revealed. There isn't one in the temple who is, is acting like this. That's all what is going to come. First, we're going to have the departure. The man of sin is going to be revealed in the tribulation period. Um, something is, okay. So again, I've told you these things. Verse 5. Now verse 6. And now you know what restrains that he might be revealed in his time. That means something's holding that back from happening. Something's keeping the man of sin from revealing himself. Something's keeping him from coming on that scene and acting like the Antichrist who is going to go for full worship. We know at the midpoint because Matthew 24, 15 tells us when it happens. Something's holding it back. Verse 7, the mystery of iniquity, the mystery of sin does already work. Only he who now hinders will continue to hinder until he's taken out of the way. Okay, now it's getting personified. What's holding this evil back is a he. The he is going to be taken out of the way and then this rampant of sin, or rampage of sin, is going to be in fullness and will fully take effect. Okay? Well, what could be holding back this? Or more specifically, who? Because we now know it's a he. Okay, well, um, does it say, do we want to get it here? Um, let me give you verse 8. Then shall that wicked one be revealed after he is taken out of the way. The wicked one will be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. That's what's going to happen to that Christ at the end. Revelation 19, read it. The, the sword out of the mouth of the Lord slays the Antichrist and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. By the way, that's another characteristic of the second coming when he comes to earth. We're told in Matthew 24, about verse 36, that all the world will see it happen like lightning from the east to the west. Everybody sees lightning like up, up the sky. Everyone will see the brightness of the Lord's coming at his second coming at the rapture, at that coming departure up in the air where we meet him, it does not say the whole world will see it. In fact, it, we know the world does not see it. The world's going to wonder what happened. New Age has got their answer. They're going to be telling people, and they already are, that the Christians are holding back the harmony of this earth. The Christians are the ones causing the troubles on this earth. So when we are removed, they're going to say, hey, don't worry about them. They've been taken out. When they are in harmony with the earth, they'll be brought back. They're just, they've are just they been taken to a place where they can be brought into the, the light. And of course, it's a false light, and it's not a true uh, happening at all. <clears throat> but again, this is what's going to go on and happen. So we need to look at who could be taken out of the way, and how could that one be taken out of the way. Why didn't Paul feel the need to say any more there? Because he already told about it. What he has told us is that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God himself. Who has more power than Satan, than Satan, is God and God alone. God has the, the say in what God says goes, and where he supersedes Satan is everywhere. Remember, Satan is not God's equal opposite. When I tell you what, what's opposite of up and you say down, what's the opposite of black and you say white, what's the opposite of God, answer nothing. There is no equal opposite to our God. <clears throat> in the work of the Holy Spirit, who is indwelling us, when we are taken up into the presence of our Lord, 
The Holy Spirit is the one who has sealed us to that day. Ephesians 1 tells us about 13, 14, 15 in there. Tells us we're sealed until that day of redemption. Until the day that we are taken home and given our salvation. I mean, we have it now, but we, we, we come into the effects of it when we enter into the presence of, of the Lord and of God in heaven. So what we are saying is, when we are departed, the Holy Spirit is taken, not only taken with us, He takes us. He brings us into the presence of the Lord. That is what opens the way now for this evil to come out on the face of the earth. Right now there is a holding back of the tide of evil because God is having mercy on His believers and He has told us He would have mercy on us, that we won't feel the full effects of his, the lack of His grace and His mercy in this world like what will be in the tribulation time. So what hinders Satan and his plan and his putting his man on the throne is the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit goes with us, it does not mean that the earth is going to be void of the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God is always moving and working on the face of the earth. But it's going to go back to the way it was before we started this age where we were indwelled with the Holy Spirit. Remember when Yeshua taught to his Talmudim, he told them, wait for him until they receive power from on high. And he also told them if he goes, then the Spirit would come, who would bring to their remembrance everything he had taught them, would even help them fully understand and act to do what he would have them to do. We know that's the time that the church began when the Holy Spirit came. We see it in Acts chapter 2. There was a mighty rushing wind that went through the, the room. You cannot see the wind, but you see its effects. That's a picture of the Spirit of God. We do not see Him, but we see the effect. When the Spirit of God came on those men in that upper room, they were able to talk languages they had never studied. They were able to give out the gospel message. It took the message to the people who were there who heard it. Many of them got saved. They took it back home because they were up to Jerusalem for a Shavuot, for one of the main festivals when all the Jewish men were to come up. Now they had the gospel. They received it in their own languages. They were amazed that these men had this language, and they took it back to their homes. We see Kepha, Peter, who was so afraid when the Lord was being crucified that he denied even knew him three times. We see right away on the scene that he stands up and he gives one of the greatest sermons. There's such boldness in him. He's got a hold of it because the Holy Spirit's within him. But when we look at, and I'll call it the Old Testament times, original covenant times, we see the working of the Holy Spirit. We see all the way in Bereshit chapter 1, verse 2. When God and Jesus are creating this earth, we see the Spirit of God hovering over the earth. We see by His hovering over it was like a, a mama chick brooding over her little chicks. His power was in effect in our creation as we know it today. He came on people during Bible times, I'm sorry, during original covenant times to do a work for Him. But then he would also leave them. We see that exemplified greatly in King Saul when King Saul would be disturbed because a, an evil spirit would come at him. But we see that, that when he was coming into his position to be king, he was even able to prophesy with the prophets because the Spirit of God came on him. He went looking for the donkeys. If you don't know the story, I'll get you the scripture reference later. He in, instead ends up being prophesied over and then prophesying. He was able to do that because the Spirit of God came on him. David, David knew the Spirit of God and he knew the lack of the Spirit of God and he said, Lord God, take not your Spirit from me. He wanted the Spirit to stay on him all the time. Are we ever taught by Sha'ol Paul to pray that? No, because we're promised instead the Holy Spirit indwells us the moment we are saved. He's like our engagement ring, which in, in that time was as good as the marriage. If you wanted to break engagement, you had to get a bill of divorcement. It was as good as being married. He's our engagement ring. He is keeping us until he presents us to our bridegroom, to the Lord himself in heaven. Remember Revelation 19? The wife has made herself ready now. She's now the wife, and they're about to enter into the marriage feast of the Lamb. That's the feast that follows after the marriage. But she's already been married. She's already received that now. We have gone into the presence of the Lord and we have received even our rewards, I believe, because we're wearing that robe of righteousness and we come back with Him to stop the battle of Armageddon, which He stops, but He will use us in ruling and reigning. 
So here we have how we see the Holy Spirit indwelling us. When we leave, the Holy Spirit goes with us. He will come back into this earth and work in the presence of the earth in the same way he did before this age began that I just described in Acts chapter 2. And so with him not indwelling the people in the way he is now, he moves himself out of the way to allow this plan to continue on. In that plan, this man of sin steps up to the plate. We see the precursor for that today. If someone can stand up, make peace between the Arabs and the Israelis, get that peace treaty brokered, then we know that it's the one that was talked about in Daniel 9 also, which Daniel 9, 24, 27 gives us the prophetic period of time also looking all the way from Daniel's day to all the way at the end of the day of the Lord, which the end of the day of the Lord is after the millennial period. It goes all the way through that. It starts with the judgment and the wicked, the wicked, um, the wrath of God being poured out on the wicked. But it goes all the way through into the millennial time where Israel receives her promises and where the Lord reigns. Uh, so it, it covers a long period of time. And the last where was that? Oh, okay. But so that's what is holding back. And Shaul Paul didn't bother to explain it any further right here because he's already taught them that they are sealed by the Holy Spirit, that they have the Holy Spirit within. So it only makes sense that he is the one. And nothing else, there's nothing else that has a power equal to holding back a tide of evil that can do battle against Satan. <clears throat> we know that the only one who can hold him back is very God himself. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I've gone long in what I thought I would do faster, uh, but I trust it is helping it make sense to you and uh, making it clear to you. Let me give you other names of the tribulation period. The day of the Lord's vengeance. That's Isaiah 34 and it's also in Jeremiah. And again, I can give you all these references in written form. Just uh, let me know. It's called the day of the Lord's wrath or of anger in Zephaniah, in Psalm, in Jeremiah, um, Ezekiel. Uh, we see many places, Romans even refers to it. Again, the author is Paul. Romans and Ephesians and 1 Thessalonians and Revelation also refer to it this way. Daniel chapter 9 that I just referred to is called Daniel's 70th week. It tells us about 70 weeks in relation to Daniel's people. Once again, Daniel has in view the same thing that the Lord was talking with the Talmudim about the view from the Jewish perspective, from the perspective of Israel, not knowing about this age that would come in between that would cause there to be 2,000 years between his first coming and his second coming. They had no idea it would be that long. Remember, Paul thought he'd be caught up in his day. Does it make it a false teaching? No. We have been given always that blessed hope that is an encouragement to our soul. It is called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob being the one who became Israel. The name given for the Jewish people. He was representative of the Jewish people. That's Jeremiah 30. You want to read verses 40, I'm sorry, 4 through 8. But it's verse 7 that refers to as the time of Jacob's trouble. So again, I've given you a number of names, a number of witnesses. The Great Tribulation is referred to for the second half in Matthew 24, verse 21, uh, in Mark 13, and in Revelation 7. So um, I, what I'm trying to do is get to a point where I can go on into my next point. You've been given many names and told many times, and the reason why we're looking at that is we're separating what is this grace age or um, church age from the tribulation age because now what we want to do is look at the signs for each so we know are we coming to tribulation times are we coming to the end of the tribulation have we been in it and we're coming to the end of it where does it fit in what's the, the signs for the end of the church age also okay I think because you're very familiar with um, some of the signs for the tribulation time because we've been talking about this so much let me show you a, a bit of a difference let's go to the signs for the end of the church age and how can I say that because remember Paul's talking to the called out assembly that's what the word is in, in the Greek it's the ecclesia the called out assembly 
He's talking to what we today call the church, but I make that very clear because the first church was made up of Jewish believers. Today it would be called Messianic. So I want to make sure that you fully understand. When Paul is giving instruction to this group of people in this age, and God raised him up to give us instruction in this age, he also brought to, to Shaul Paul one who would su succeed him, one who would carry the work on. I'm referring to Timothy. He called Timothy his beloved son in the faith. Timothy was part Jewish, part Gentile. So we know he had some of his Jewish background, but he wasn't um, fully um, raised in it. We see that in, in different things. I don't want to get sidetracked. But it's in, in his letter to Timothy that he gives the signs of the end of the age of the called out assembly. So let's look at that that second. The Timothy, it follows right after um, first, second Thessalonians if you're looking for it. And we're going to the second letter, means that Shel Paul already wrote a letter to Timothy. Now he's writing a second letter. And remember, he's writing to his precious son in the faith. He's writing to encourage him to grow him up in the faith, but he's also telling him that he's to take charge. And so he's giving him instruction in the last days also. Um, and in chapter 3, in the second letter to Timothy, he's going to tell him about the last days, okay? Now, because we hear the last days, you cannot just jump and say, oh, that's the day of the Lord. No, you've got to know who was he talking to? Who is he writing to? He's writing to his son in the faith. He's writing to the, the time, to the people in the time called the church. He's not writing now to... Israel, he's writing to the ones that, that for all sake and purposes we've got to call the church. Now remember the church doesn't replace Israel but God raised up the church when Israel did not raise up and represent um, God to the people. God brought in this body, grafted in, Romans 9, 10, and 11, we're in the chapter 11 where they're grafted in but he makes it very clear. He's bringing Israel back in too. That he set her aside for a time and moved her branches out of the way to bring in the grafting in of the, the church. But he's going on with his original plan. He's going to continue and hold his promises true that he gave to Israel also. And he even warns those who come in in the church age not to brag to Israel and say, well, you blew it and look at me because if God was willing to set them aside for a time because they weren't doing the fullness of their job, he will also set you aside if you have a, a boasting attitude and don't um, treat it with the respect that you should. We need to respect that the Jewish people brought us our scriptures, that they're not a forgotten people. They're not a replaced people, which is what replacement theology teaches. God will keep his word to Israel. If he did not, we would need to fear he not would not keep his word to the church also, to us, but he will. So Paul is now writing to those who are, well, to Timothy, who's going to be sharing it with the churches. So he's talking to the people in that age called the church age or the age of grace. And he is saying, this know also in the last days of the church age, of the called out assembly, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Okay? There's going to be trials. There's going to be tribulation. He's not saying, oh, happy day is coming. We're all going to go to Disneyland. <laughs> He's saying there's going to be perilous times. The Greek even says grievous times. Well, are we not in grievous times today? Do not the world conditions grieve your heart today? If you can turn on the news at night and it doesn't touch your heart, you don't hurt and pray for the people that you're hearing about, then check whether you're alive. Check whether you've got a human heart there that, that's been touched by the Lord that cares for this world in that way. How are they going to see grievous times and perilous times? Paul gives a description. See if this sounds like the newspaper of today or Channel 7 News last night. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. That's talking about men turning to men and women turning to women, whether you want to call it what it is or not, that's what it's telling us. Truce breakers, peace treaty breakers, false accusers, liars, 
incontinent, those who don't stand strong for what they say, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Do we not see the world come against those who are trying to do good? We see all of these in effect today. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Have you noticed in this pandemic, people are starting to get very restless now. The weather's turned good, they've been confined, they're getting cabin fever, but notice what they're wanting. Are they saying, oh, let me back, I want to go to church. No, the lion's share, we may be saying that, but the lion's share is saying, I want to go to the beach. I want to go to the sports events. That's what they're hauling about, that they don't have their pleasures, and their pleasures aren't godly. We are the small drop in the bucket compared to the world that's complaining. Having a form of godliness but denying the power of it. That's all of those who are claiming, oh, I'm a Christian. I've been born in, in America. That makes me a Christian. Or I'm a Christian because I do go to church. I show up for God. I give Ms. one hour on Sunday. I might even give him another hour on Wednesday. They're not, it's not in their heart. And so they don't have the power of the Lord in them because they don't have the Holy Spirit in them. And he says, the ones who are like that, turn away from them. Don't associate with them. Don't be involved with things with them. For this sort are they who creep into houses, lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with various lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. How many PhDs do we have today and yet they don't know the truth. They don't know Jesus. This is sad and, and uh, leading the, the silly women captive. Some have said that's even the, the soap operas and all that, that were sucking up um, those who were idle in their homes and were just wasting away their time and getting caught up. It's also believed that they're the ones who get caught up in, in um, uh, gossip. Sorry, couldn't think of the word. The gossiping and, and they, they tell stories on each other and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. That's the picture of the last days. Do we see that today? Yes. I think every single word described there pop something into our minds. Oh yeah, there, there, there. This time, this event, this happening, some more than others, but we see all of these events. That would lead us to believe that we are looking at the end of our church age. Now, let me also take you to, uh, to Paul's um, first letter to Timothy. Just back up a few pages and go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to read the first three verses there. And we read there, now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, in the end times, what end times? End times of who you're a part of, Timothy, end times of the church, end times of this age of grace, some shall depart from the faith. Now here is the part that can give us that apostasia that does sound like a departure from the faith also. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. That means that there are going to be those who were in among us, who are going to turn away from us, who are going to go and believe the lies that are out there, the lies that are given by seducing spirits. We know that, that Jezebel had a spirit to seduce the, the men of Israel. They were seduced sexually, we saw that, but they were seduced spiritually into false idol worship. Do we see seducing spirits that take people into idolatry today? Yes. An idol is anything that you put in place of God in that place that, that is deserving of, of your worship and your honor. Anything else that's on that throne is an idol. That's a seducing spirit. That can be anything from idolatry that, that is bowed down and worshipped to, literally idols that are seen in false religions and cults that are bowed down and worshipped to, but that also can be what you put in that place that you idolize it more than God and you can fill in the blank we know even the love of money leads to the root of all evil that even even in greed we find it being a seducing spirit money hunger for money wanting money how many oh I gotta work on Sunday because if I don't work on Sunday I won't get the money I need can you not trust your God to enable you to make during the week what you need to make in the week, that you can take that day of worship. And for us, it can be a Saturday because in Messianic, we are honoring our Shabbat. We set aside, God told them in the Shabbat, set aside your personal pleasure. Set aside doing your work that brings you your income. Set that time aside and give it to me. 
how many people set aside a day for the Lord in this age that we're in now and how many work right through it and you see no difference in it I can give you the testimony of one who worked um, this goes back enough years I'm safe saving saying it but it's recent time she worked for AAA AAA has a quota amount that you have to get if you don't get your quota you lose your job it's a battle every week they have to get that quota when she was to be hired by them they wanted her to work on Saturdays she was a Jewish believer she felt that was the day she should honor to God and she told them she could not work on Saturdays they told her Saturday is your best working day you'll get the ones who want to make vacation plans you get the the most what brings in the most does you'll be getting your quota many people get half of what their quota is on Saturday they do the other half Monday through Friday but they need that Saturday she said I'll stand by my faith and trust my God that I can do it by Friday evening and not be here on Saturday and they told her if you turn in your quota we'll leave you alone if you don't make a quota you're out the door do you know every week she worked for AAA God saw to it that she had her quota by Friday sundown when she needed to quit to honor her God I use her for an example for any and all of us today if you think you've got to put your work first you've got the horse before the be, yeah no the cart before the horse <laughs> you're out of order and I, I encourage you step out in faith and watch your God work okay what else happens here besides the seducing spirits the doctrines of demons are the false um, cults the false religions anything that teaches you uh, anything different than a relationship with the one true and living God that you come into him through the way called Yeshua Jesus is a is a demon is a doctrine a demon is a false teaching is a cult and that's what it's talking about verse 2 speaking lies in hypocrisy do we not see lies are all around us people lie without it meaning a thing to them we are even taught in the Arab world and I'm not saying every Arab and I'm not coming against the people but I'm saying that this is the general thought that they are taught is if the lie brings you the end it's justified that you are free to lie to get your end means that's why Israel has such a hard time partnering with the Arabs is each one who comes up to the plate can lie and say yeah I'll, I'll do this with you Israel and they don't mean it in the least well if you're in any kind of a business relationship with someone who lies if you're in a personal relationship you know there can be no trust there and you know how quickly it breaks down and how many of us have experienced that in our work field in our families in these false religions we see speaking lies and hypocrisy they say one thing they don't live it their conscience is seared with a hot iron they don't even feel guilt over lying they also do things like forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from certain foods we know that there are false religions that demand these things of the people and these are things that it says which God's created he's created them to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth and it goes on from there so again the signs that Shaul Paul gave to Timothy for the end time of his age what he was in the time he was living I think that we see they're all in actuality happening today we've got that falling away that rebellion that it can mean we have the false teachers we have the seducers those who are deceiving we have also scoffers let me take you real quickly to second Peter second Kepha again that's two letters written by Kepha and we go um, just before the little books of John and uh, Revelation in our scriptures second Peter chapter 3 verses 3 and 4 knowing this first that there shall come in the last days now does Peter sound like he's talking about the same time as Paul yes they're talking about the last days they're talking to the believers in in what we call the church age what will there be scoffers walking after their own less and saying where's the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation okay what does that mean how many of you have heard oh you've been saying for so long the Lord's gonna come and he hasn't come it's just a fantasy it's not going to happen we hear that more and more today 
when my dad was alive and he was in college and he was seeking and searching, he had not found the truth yet, he heard his professor scoff that way. So it was true 50 years ago, but it's even more true today in the last day. Drop down to verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. In other words, uh, because they're saying that the Lord's not going to come, I mean, you're saying the Lord's going to come and He hasn't yet, we're not looking at God's timing. God's timing is not ours. The days are not the same. And when you look at the whole time of eternity, then all of a sudden, our life is a short period of time. So to say, oh, well, He's delaying His coming, He's not going to come, you've been saying that, holds no value. In other words, it, it, if you look at a year and how fast a year goes, it's just dropping a bucket to us now. But you give a year to a little child who only knows a few years in their life, and that year is a long time. You tell them you're not going to have another birthday for 365 days, and they're like, wow, it'll never come. Well, that's what these people are doing. They're looking at it like a child looks at a year. But when we see time according to the Lord, He's not delaying. His time to come will be, as He said, in His perfect timing. Now, I don't have time, I don't think, maybe I can. Uh, I'm going to run over just a few minutes to complete the signs for the end of the church age, and then we're going to go ahead and pick this up next week. I thought we'd do it in one lesson, but here goes Rochelle again. Full words. <laughs> But again, I hope I'm making it clear to you. Go with me real quickly to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. I referred to the churches that were written to in chapters 2 and 3 before, and I referred to it as learning lessons from each church, but we also see periods of time. When we look at this, we can take the seven churches in order. We can start with the first church given uh, in chapter 2, verse 1, the church of Ephesus. And we see in historical time, we see specifics that were fulfilled in that time that fit it exactly. And we can take each church in order and move through time that way all the way down to church number 6 and 7. We see time in that way that, that today's timing is, is the time of the church of Philadelphia and the church of Laodicea. Now, because we're looking at what the end times will look like, we're going to look at Laodicea, but let me tell you, Philadelphia is also the time of the end of the church age because these two churches run simultaneously together. The Church of Philadelphia is on fire for the Lord. The Church of Philadelphia loves the Lord, has the Lord in their heart, wants to share that with others, is sending out people to tell others they are getting the gospel out and they are commanded for it. They don't have condemnation in there. We're going to go back and look at Philadelphia, if, hopefully before I end this class today. If not, we'll pick it up next week. But uh, we're also now going to look at the Church of Laodicea. This church is in the last days also, just like Philadelphia, but it's like the opposite of Philadelphia. Where Philadelphia is on fire for the Lord, loves the Lord, is in the Word, studying the Word, sending out missionaries. Laodicea thinks that they're wonderful. They think that they're all good. Let's read it, okay? Starting with verse 14. The, the angel, the messenger to the church of Laodicea says, write, uh, told John to write, these things says, who? The one who's called a man, the one who is faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. We know this is Jesus. So the, the words that are coming to the Laodicea are the words from the Lord. And he says, I know your works. You aren't either cold or hot. I would that you were cold or hot because then there'd be some value. Um, telling you just real quickly, there were three um, uh, calm cities that were close together. Laodicea, um, Colise, and I'm trying to think of the third one. Um, it'll come back to me in a moment. But there, there were the three that were very close. It was like a triangle. The water would come from one down to the other. It would start out cold. And by the time it got down to this other, to, to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. Then there was the hot springs from this other, and I'll get you, I'll come back next week with the three names. It was hot, but again, by the time it, it funneled down to another city, it was lukewarm. 
Well, there was value in the hot. There was value in the cold. The lukewarm wasn't worth anything. When it was lukewarm, the Lord wanted to spew it out of his mouth. It, it didn't have any value. Hot is good. Cold is good for certain things. But lukewarm, there was no value in it. And that's what he's saying. I wish you were either hot or cold. But because you're neither hot nor cold, I want to just vomit you out of my mouth. I'm going to be gross, but that's what he's saying. I want to spew you out of my mouth. Because, why? Why are they not hot or cold? They're not hot or cold for the Lord. They're indifferent about the Lord. They're indifferent about His commandments and His instructions. And they think that they're just fine. Verse 17, Because you say, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And you don't know you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. I counsel you to buy me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich, white raiment that you might be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness will not appear, and anoint your eyes with salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, repent, turn from your ways. This is the, the it not only has the rebellious, but it has those who have only been the professors. They have the facade of being religious. They put on the garments like they are all this and something too. And they think they are. They think they're doing deeds in the Lord's name. And they're not doing it in the Lord's name. They're doing it in their own strength. They're doing it to please themselves. They're doing it to show man. Look at me. Look how great I am. Look at my philanthropic works. Look at how I give to the poor. Look at how I help the needy. But they're the ones that are going to be saying to the Lord one day when he shuts them out, Lord, didn't I do this in your name? And the Lord's going to say, I never knew you. You did never become one with me. And he hits on several points here that uh, they think they're wealthy, but the wealth is in our relationship with the Lord. We lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't still break through and destroy. We don't raise up riches that are on this earth that can be destroyed. Fire comes and destroys. And even though gold is, isn't destroyed in that way, still gold is losing its value. It becomes priceless. It, it, it's not that they become rich, but their riches are going to be worth nothing. It's going to take a bag of gold to buy a loaf of bread in the tribulation. How long do you think their gold is going to last? But not only that, they thought that the, they were clothed. Remember what we're clothed in? The fine linen, clean and white. That's the righteous acts of our Lord. He puts His robe of righteousness on us. So when He's telling them, you're naked, He's telling you, you've never come into my saving grace. You're not one of me. You are not in salvation where you're clothed. You need to find it out before you're out there and embarrass yourself like the emperor's new clothes that weren't, and the world sees your nakedness. You need to repent. You need to have a heart change. You need to come into a relationship with me where you will be hot for me. And then when he hits on the, the eye salve that they, um, they need to anoint their eyes with eye salve that they may see, it's even been um, discovered from study and from archaeological uh, findings that there was an eye salve that was being sold at the time of John's day. And it came from this area and it claimed to have medicinal value. And it has been tested in the chemistry labs of the day and there was no value in it at all. So here they're, they're giving out like snake oil. They're giving out what, oh, this will help you. And it was worthless. And he's telling them, you're blind, but you, it's not a, a physical earthly blindness. You're spiritually blind. You think you put on eye salve that you can see. Well, it's had no value for you because it's not from me. And you are blind. You are naked. You are poor because you don't have the riches of eternity. You don't have the wealth that we have when we're joint heirs with the Lord. When we come into salvation and all the blessings that come with it. This is what he is referring to. And this is what's happening. And do we not see those churches today that are caught up in the show? And I'm not speaking specific. I'm not here to judge them. But I will tell you how to judge them. And the way that we are told to is by the word of God. That we are to look for their fruits. That we are to see the workings of the Lord in them. And if it is just show. And we're not seeing people being brought to salvation. People being taught to get into the word of God. Read the word of God. Study the word of God. Instead they're having their ears tickled with the words that make them feel good. 
oh, you know, be good to people, do these good deeds, and, and God will see your good deeds, and He will reward you. You're a good person. He's going to let you into heaven. Well, remember, we've already talked about that. Who's to say where that standard is good enough? When let in and when not let in. That's not how God judges it and what He says. We come in through the shed blood. But there are those who give the false name, who say that they are in Christ, but they are not lifting up Christ. They are not the Philadelphia church. They are not giving out the word of God. They are not in Bible study. They are not helping you grow in your walk in the Lord. Instead, they're helping you grow in the world, and many of their leaders are, you're helping them grow in their pocketbooks and so forth. And we know that there are those who are in it for the money. They're not in it because they have a heart for God. This is a contrast between the two churches, and I'm out of time where I cannot do it justice because when we go into the Philadelphia church, we are going to see that there is a promise to this church. The promise to this church is that they will not experience the tribulation. I will give that to you in three points in one verse in Revelation 3 when we come back next week. So that's where we will pick it up. We'll look at the Church of Philadelphia. We'll look at the promise to that church that, that assures them they will not go through the tribulation. And if that be true, then the signs of the end that we are seeing that we're talking about have to be for the church age. It cannot be the signs of the tribulation because then they would be going through it. But remember... Israel will go through the tribulation and will come out of the tribulation. Remember, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. It was given to Daniel for his people. Who were his people? The Jewish people. They were given 70 uh, weeks and told about 70 weeks in their historical time period. Not that it all passed. We know 69 weeks have happened now. There's a 70th week to come. That just happens to be a seven-year period. Hmm. You think it might be the seven-year period called the tribulation? It'll make a whole lot of sense. But we'll look at all of that next week. We'll tie it up. We'll look also just a bit more at the soon coming signs of Messiah in our age today. Why we say that we see signs in our day that were not signs 100 years ago. So that we know how close that we are. And I think that will be, I'll look and see if I missed anything else in my notes. Oh, we'll also look at what's called the Day of Christ, because we interchanged the name of the Lord and the name of Christ in our uh, vocabulary today. But Scripture does not. So when it refers to the Day of Christ, it is separate from the Day of the Lord. So I'll also look quickly at that so that you can differentiate. When we are done, you should be able to, to say, okay, here are the signs for the tribulation and the end of the tribulation. Here are the signs for what we call church or grace and the end of that age. Here is the first coming, the coming in the air called the rapture or the departure, and the second coming. And you should be able to say, okay, with all of this in view, looking from here to this point, where are we today? I think the answer will be very clear. So I'm sorry to leave you on a cliffhanger. But hopefully it'll make you want to come back for part two because we are definitely past time. I should have gotten this started a little earlier. I will try to do that next week. So please come faithfully. Our Zoom room opens at 1 p.m. You can come in and you can talk with each other. By 1.20, I like to take over, have a prayer request about 1.25, get into prayer and start at 1.30. We're still having trouble with some people getting into Zoom. That's why we're using a little bit of grace in the grace age <laughs> to help them get in, help us get connected. I've seen many more come on since we started. Um, I, I'm glad you come at any time you can. Just realize we want to try to get started more on time next week. I'm really going to push hard to do that. If you missed the beginning or you want to hear some of this again, um, you can go to bit.ly forward slash capital H C W capital P E R L slash again no, no slash okay and then uh, you can put the word tabernacle or the word Genesis um, these are teachings that are continuing from my teachings what I've got some teachings on some of Revelation up there uh, on the, tr the tabernacle, our beginning of Genesis, which we'll go back to when we actually can come into the same room together again. It's coming, hang in there. Uh, but you can go to that site. 
Uh, again, if you missed the site, um, you think you know how to contact me. I'm not going to put that out here uh, right now, but we'll find a way to get you the information that you need. Next Saturday, when you shoot it, the next Bible class you shoot out soon, we'll put the bit link in there. Okay, Roger is saying on the next class, next Wednesday, we'll have a way for you to see the bit.ly link. So if you don't know how to contact me and you miss it, you missed it today, we'll have it in writing where you can see it. We'll use the whiteboard, I presume. We'll put it behind me and you can actually see that and uh, access it then at that point. If you have questions from today, we're out of time. I should have stopped earlier to allow you to ask questions. If you have questions, you can stay on in the Zoom room with me. I will write down the questions. I'm not going to answer them in the way that I will when the whole group is there, for fairness to anyone who misses it that way. Um, if you're desperate for an answer, sure, we'll go into I'll get you an answer, whether it be now or one-on-one. -on -one. Um, do remember that uh, when you're on, everybody is able to see what's going on. We mute your mics so that you can't be heard, but they're still seeing. I appreciate you all been great today. Just warning you so you don't do something you're embarrassed by. As Dosi said, she was told by another group, if you've got your camera on, you need to have your pants on. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Um, in a, just a moment, I will close in a word of prayer, and then we will open the Zoom room for conversation again. You will be able to talk to each other. Um, have that little bit of fellowship. I know we miss each other. I miss you terribly. I'm sending out air hugs. I'm hugging you all. Kisses to all. Love you all. This is not the end for a whole nother week. If you want to be involved in other Bible studies, again, link to me and I'll link you from Tuesday through Saturday. We have something going every single day. The only day that, that we don't in our ministry, we give you Sunday and Monday. So all the other days we have something um, through via Zoom or teleconferencing or both. And uh, there are many other connections we can give you on those other days also. So shalom to all. Lord be with you all. Um, I wish I could do my Hebrew well. I'd give you the ironic blessing. But let's, let's close in a word of prayer. Adonai Yeshua, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have been our teacher today, that you have been here, that your spirit has been touching our hearts as we have heard your word. Now we ask that you bring back to our remembrance via the, the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, what you want us to hold on to, those words that were true and lasting. Lord, let it encourage and strengthen each one of us. Thank you, you've given us a blessed hope that in a day and age when it's already hard, we don't have to fear going into even worse that we know that there is a day coming when we will get to be home with you. Lord, we want to take loved ones and friends and others with us also. Give us the ability to share you, to bring to their attention in a way that, that they will see what we have, that they will want the love that we have, that they will want the answers that we have. Because, Lord God, you are everything that we need. And when we only have you, it is enough, Dayenu. We thank you. We praise you. We thank you that our prayers take us right up into your very presence. We thank you. You give us freely grace and mercy. Oh, Lord God, where would we be without you? Thank you that we who know you will never know that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. Lord, help each one who is struggling. Strengthen them in their faith. Fill them with, with your peace, your shalom, and with your presence, Lord as only you can do. And thank you that we can look forward to a day here on earth gathering together if we don't gather together first around your feet. Far better, Lord. We're anxious to come home and thank you for that blessed hope. In the holy name of our Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah, Mashiach, our Savior, our Lord Adonai, Amen and Amen. Okay.